Hello everyone, uh, my name is Sai, I'm a consultant advisor at Belong. Um, before we begin this session, if you are someone who requires a sign language interpreter, kindly scroll onto the interpreter's video, press the three dots that appear at its top and select pin video. This will make the interpreter your main window. You can also choose the grid view by clicking on the nine small squares on the top right hand side of your screens so that you're able to see same size windows for all panelists. Belong Online Literature Festival or BOLF is an initiative of Belong, a social venture that seeks to bring discrimination free services and experiences to people who face identity based discriminations. We run programs for inclusive housing, including mental health, inclusive research, as well as a book club and library for inclusive literatures. You can learn more about these on www.belong.net. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge the tireless efforts of our festival partners, our media partner, The Wire, our cultural partner, the British Council, and our accessibility partner, Access for All, without whom this would not, have, would not be possible today. Now on to today's session. This, discussion, this session is on why diversity and inclusion in children's literature is necessary with Carol Mitchell, Naibi Renoso, uh, Navjot Kaur, Bilal Vacharamani, and the session will be moderated by Shranya Gambhir, who has a BA in English and Journalism from Ashoka University. Most recently, she was a fellow with the Teach for India, where she taught children on issues of gender and prejudice. Uh, before I begin, I just want to introduce all the panelists today. So let's begin with Carol. Carol is the author of 14 children books. She enjoys writing for children and positively impacting their lives. Most of her books are based in the Caribbean and provide children with an engaging peek into the culture, history, and geography of the Caribbean. Carol is also the founder of Caribbean Reads Publishing, which focuses on representing authentic stories and authors of the Caribbean. Her most recent works include Another Day, Pirates at Port Royal, She Chee's Adventures, and the Caribbean Adventure series. Navjot Kaur. Navjot Kaur is the trailblazer behind Saffron Press. She advocates for greater diversity in children's literature through books that reflect a more accurate representation of the Sikh identity. With over a decade of experience of mentoring pre-service candidates and teaching in classrooms across two continents and diverse communities, Navjot has become a passionate advocate of culturally relevant education. She is the author of three children's books, with her first Alliance Main winning an Honours Book Award for Multicultural and International Awareness. Beetle. When Beetle Vachani is not reading a children's book, she's editing or writing one. Editor Scissor Hands at Pratham Books, she is part of a fabulous and fun team that creates picture books. She's the former editor of Time Out Bangalore. Beetle has also worked with 350.org, Fair Trade, and Sanctuary Asia. She's an award-winning author who writes about the environment and is a part of the Nalanda Academy's Abhyan Library Movement. Thank you all for being with us today. I see that Naive has joined us. Hi, Naive. Hi. Hello. Love you. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. Um, I apologize. I thought the session was in 20 minutes, so but I'm oh. here. I've been I've been up for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thank you so much. I'm just going to introduce you and then we can start. Okay, sounds good. Uh, yeah. Naibi is an, a, Me a Mexican-American multi-Emmy award-winning journalist, speaker, and author based in Los Angeles, California. Her popular children's books have been featured in Forbes, BuzzFeed, and LA Times, to name a few. In 2018, she founded Contodo Press, a publishing company that creates books to amplify the voices of underrepresented communities. Her first children's book, Be, Brave, Be Bold, Be Brave, 11 Latinas Who Made U.S. History, was an Amazon number one bestseller and highlights 11 Latina women who excelled in different categories. So this is us. <laughs> Thank you for joining us so early in the morning, Naive. I know it's Thank super you. early. <laughs> so, um, you know, this, this panel is obviously about diversity in children's literature. But I think one of the strengths of everyone present here right now is the different contexts and backgrounds that you all come from. And so I want to begin by first asking you, 
um, what drew your attention to the gaps in diversity in children's literature, um, specific to your context and specific to what your experiences have been? And what led you to publishing in the first place? Because from my research, there are very unique reasons why you've all entered into this space. So yeah, let's begin with that, yeah. Any yeah. yeah, we can start with Navjot. Okay. Um, thank you again for inviting me and hello to all of the fellow panelists. Um, so my name is Navjot Kaur. I'm the founder of Saffron Press. Um, I launched Saffron Press um, about 10 years ago. I'd been teaching for over a decade and I'd been teaching in different environments. So I understood children's books pretty well. I'd been writing for way beyond that as well. So I'd been um, sending manuscripts to traditional publishers, trying to get my books published, but um, I was faced with uh, lots of barriers along the way. Um, so at the point when we welcomed our son into our lives and realized that he was profoundly deaf, um, I kind of shifted my perspective and my patience at that point and realized that if I wanted books that represented him in the schools that he would go into, then I wanted to make sure that that representation was there. And I wasn't going to wait for traditional publishers to recognize the need or to understand why um, our representation was necessary on classroom shelves and in homes. I thought, you know what, I'm going to try and do it myself. So at that point, I launched Saffron Press, and the first book, Alliance Main, does talk about the Sikh identity, but I wanted to move away from what we usually saw on shelves at that point. So during my entire childhood and up till that point, all I saw was Sikhs represented as food festivals and folk tales. So at that point, I wanted to shift the narrative. I wanted to ensure that we were disrupting the status quo and showing that we exist in this world and we have very different identities. We have intersectionalities. When it comes to disability, you don't really see disability in children's books represented alongside race. And so I wanted to make sure that my child would feel like he belongs somewhere when he goes out into the world. And I wanted him to have a really strong foundation in all of his identities, so his faith identity as well as his deaf identity. So there was a real need for this work at that point. And so I wanted to um, create Saffron Press, not only to um, showcase accurate Sikh identity, accurate representation, but also to ensure that, you know, in classrooms, when I walk into the classroom, I was usually the only teacher of color in my entire school. So I wanted to ensure that all of these children coming into classrooms didn't all only look for children who look like them, but they're also looking at who exists in the world and learning about who exists in the world and also to, to raise critical thinkers. So um, that's kind of my context behind Saffron Press. That's amazing, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Um, Karen, do you wanna go next? Hi, sure. Um, it's morning here, so good morning. <laughs> um, my name is Carol Mitchell, and I am the founder of Caribbean Weeds Publishing. So I'm from a small, very tiny island in the Caribbean called St. Kitts Nevis, but I grew up and I've lived in several places of the Caribbean, so I kind of have like a, a larger Caribbean identity, or that's how I feel. Um, so I was in 2007, I was living in St. Kitts and um, with my children. And I wanted them, like they were avid readers, and I wanted them to have books and to find books, you know, a variety of books. I grew up, you know, reading a lot of British books. We met, we learned about snow and crumpets and things that like meant nothing to me. But um and I wanted them to have a different experience with literature. And so I went looking for books that, you know, kind of authentically represented the Caribbean outside of, you know, us being exotic or whatever, other things that people think about the Caribbean. And I wasn't finding them. Um, and I kind of got tired of reading books by non-Caribbean writers. 
and so I began writing and um, I had a similar experience in Abjad and I think you'll probably see, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, um, but you probably see this I think across the panel with respect to traditional publishers. You know, um, the way I felt about it, if a traditional publisher would say to me, this is a horrible book, we are not going to publish this, but I couldn't even get in the door for someone to say something to me and you know that was extremely frustrating and so I also decided that I would um, you know do my own books and then try to make the opportunities available to other Caribbean authors and you know one of the things that we do at Caribbean Reads is that we try to respond to all of our um, submissions and you know a lot of times we can't take the books on but to give some feedback and to encourage them to work on this some more, have some ideas and, um, you know, try again. And we, you know, we really want, we really are looking to develop the, the skills and the, um, the, the stock of books coming out of, the, out of the Caribbean and from the islands and to dismantle some stereotypes. I mean, we have like a tons of things <laughs> we want to get done, but that's pretty much how things got started. So I started with um, my first book, um, Adventure at Brimson Hill in 2007 and moved on from there. You know, I've written quite a bit myself. I'm not writing as much now because I'm doing more in terms of supporting other authors and publishing other authors. But, um, and I've been teaching and, you know, doing a number of other things, but that's pretty much how we got started. I started Con Todo Press because it really hurt me as a mother and as a Latina to, to listen to back then when President Trump was a candidate for a Republican candidate for presidency in 2015, when he was demonizing my, my people, my culture, my community, uh, specifically the immigrant Latinos calling us, you know, um, criminals, gang, gang members, uh, drug dealers, it really, really just shifted something um, inside me as a journalist, because I've been a journalist for over 25 years, and my job as a journalist is to really um, speak the truth, right? Uh, so as a mom and as a journalist, I just felt like President Trump's demonization of Latinos in the United States was my call to action to create um, a publishing company that would, you know, have a positive image and create a positive image of the very people that he was demonizing of the Latinos. Um, here in the United States, there's over 60 million Latinos. Uh, we're almost 20% of the population. So there's a lot of children, obviously, that uh, were receiving those negative messages because you can't really filter what children hear or not, right? If, if a leader of the country is saying all of these horrible things about our community, as much as we want to protect our children from those harsh, hateful words, we just can't. We simply just can't. So that's why I really decided um, that my mission was going to be to create books that portrayed my community in a positive light, because we are a, a hardworking community. Um, we were actually here in the United States before the United States was a country. Um, yeah. Parts of California, Texas, Arizona, Nevada was Mexico. Um, and for us to be uh, offended and to be, like I said, demonized, I just couldn't just sit here and, and take it, right? Um, so that's why I decided to create Con Todo Press. And I wanted to make books, um, not so much about the immigrant experience, but about the, the, the Latinos that have already accomplished great things in this country. So I profiled in my first two books, I profiled um, highly regarded Latinos that are Oscar winners, that are scientists, that are inventors, that are um, you know, people that are regarded like Nobel Peace Prize winners, uh, that are Supreme Court justices, that are activists, because I wanted the Latino children to be able to see themselves reflected in a positive light um, because subconsciously it concerned me that all of these hateful words from the leader of our country was going to affect our community you know in the future because as a child as a child you're absorbing all of these messages right and, yeah. and as 
Uh, I remember as a little girl, I, I didn't see any books about my community. Um, so we were practically invisible uh, when I was little. We, we, are, we are unfortunately considered second class citizens in this country. Um, Hispanics are paid a lot less than you know, the average person in this country. Um, it's really difficult to, you know, to create generational wealth. So there's a lot of issues. Um, and to me, part of solving those issues was to start with the young ones to start them on a path of if they can see it, they can believe it, and they can be it. Uh, so that's basically the origin story of Contodo Press. Thank you for sharing. Bija? Uh, wow, such great stories, everyone. Uh, you know, like Carol, I grew up reading British books with scones and ginger ale and pics on islands that were owned by children. Uh, so when I started reviewing children's books as the editor, uh, as the kids editor at Time Out in Mumbai, um, I saw this wealth of Indian children's books being created. And they were pretty amazing to see children that look like us, that sounded like us, that talked like us. Um, but also there you kind of realized that there was a split. There was one, there was the the roost was always the bestsellers were always the folk tales and the hindu mythology and the rest of the books were always somewhere else like the uh, lesser the indie publishers were the ones who were doing more interesting books in terms of diversity in terms of inclusion and um, uh, one of the reasons that i do what i do is because of my late partner he um, it told me how he couldn't see himself in the sto in the hindu mythology stories because uh, they were not stories he grew up with. And it made me realize that even within publishing, we, uh, we are looking at a certain kind of dominant rhetoric constantly. And so now I work at Pratham Books and um, uh, when I started working there, it suddenly hit me, uh, these statistics would come our way, you know, about how there's just a lack of accessible reading material uh, children need to be taught in a language they understand, but they're not being taught in that. Uh, where is the regional, where are the regional language books and things like that. And so which is why part of my journey has been a lot of working with own voice writers and illustrators, trying, uh, discovering them, reaching out to them, and also working with them to create some, what I think are fantastic picture books um, for children. Thank you all for sharing. Honestly, uh, so many diverse experiences have like led up to this. And so actually what you're talking about, Vijal, actually like looking for the right kind of illustrators and the authors and giving them the platform is so important, which leads me to my next question. And, and tell me what you think here, because I feel that when you are trying to represent a certain community or the voice of someone who is considered to be marginalized, um, what ends up happening is that the burden of representation falls on whatever you choose to do. Right? So if you're writing a book about a particular community that faces identity-based discrimination, it's almost like that book, the onus of that book, like the entire onus of representation is on that book then. You know, you look for, you look for all the right answers from that one particular piece of literature. And, and I'm, I'm guessing that that is a hard challenge to understand because a one person cannot speak for the com for an entire community of experiences because that's what ends up happening. You get compartmentalized. And also what is the experience because you're both writers and you're also publishers or you're editing or you're like commissioning books, right? So when you're in doing so, what is, what is the role that you have played and what has your experience been in a dismantling certain stereotypes? and also the exoticization of particular communities and in presenting this varied experience. I know this sounds like a heavy question, but anyone who wants to take it. Nijal, you can start too. I saw you wanted to say something. <laughs> so um, I spoke about this a little bit in the morning today, actually, and uh, I hope I don't sound uh, like I'm being repetitive, but uh, it's exactly what you said that um, uh, when you're looking at books that are centered around a certain region or have a certain voice, it does become this cumbersome, oh, and I'm going to represent this whole community. 
Um, that's it. Uh, one of our interns who's now an art director with us, he discovered as part of his master's research as to how the Northeast region of India is constantly represented in children's picture books as details. Now, the character they are completely as do the settings. Everything becomes much more urban centric, much, much more homogeneous. And it's realized that we don't have to make it about a certain space by drumming it about that, like make, centering it around that. Just ha get the, get, make sure the writers, the illustrators, the setting for stories are authentic and that comes across. So we have wonderful profiles of India's first female mountaineer from the uh, Northeast who climbed Mount Everest, Tini Mina. We have stories about Wobbly Tooth, which are set in the Northeast, which have very, very Northeastern characters, set, settings and all of that. But uh, the stories are very universal. And I think that that's perhaps something that's very important to us as publishers, as well as uh, uh, editors, that the books we create kind of, uh, uh, when a child reads that book, Either they see themselves reflected in it or they see other children reflected in it without it becoming about, without it othering the experience. Because the moment you box it into folk tales, into stories of conflict, sometimes that can also happen. And which is why I, I find this approach, we're experimenting, but we, I've, as a reader also, I like reading books that just have different characters. And that's what makes it fun, right? I have a similar experience. So, you know, um, one of the stereotypes that we face in the Caribbean is kind of this attitude, you know, we're on an island, sand, sea, you know, everybody's partying, drinking rum, we're all laid back, we're not really doing too much. And, you know, the truth is that the, the Caribbean is always extremely diverse within the Caribbean. You know, we have people from of all different races of, you know, just a wide swath of I think people are really surprised to find that um, is the case that a lot of East Indians in Trinidad and Tobago and throughout the Caribbean, we have um, people from China, we have a lot of large Lebanese community and many other communities um, represented there. And so um, I think that it's really important to, for us to try and get past that, um, those stereotypes. And one of the things that we try to do, um, like Bijal, is the, the whole idea that there are people in the in these stories, right? And there are characters, and they're they're like you know we have a wide swath of people, just like you know we represent the world. And so you have this the space, and then you have the setting, which is different from you know an English setting, an Indian setting, an American setting, whatever. But that's kind of a a backdrop, and you know the people might speak a little bit differently, or they, but at the heart of the story is really about you know the human emotions and the human development and the you know that sort of experience. And one of the things that you know I always keep in the back of my mind is that when I was looking for books for my kids, I came across this book by a publisher which I won't mention, a really big name, and um, the. The, there's a, you know, it's just a story going on, stories going around nice and nicely, and then the child's father pulls out a bottle, and there's a lot of, like, kind of wink, wink, and nod, nod, and it's revealed there's a bottle of rum, and the, if the, the rum bottle, like, it had no, no part in the plot, there was just no reason for it to be there, except that someone thought it was really cute and funny, um, you know, and this idea that, you know, we're all just hanging out drinking rum. And yeah, we make fantastic rum in the crib, you know, we drink it and that's <laughs> fine. But, you know, there's, there's a lot, lot more um, to who we are and what we do. And so that is actually one of the books that's often in the back of my mind and that really spurred me on to, to write and try and dismantle um, some of the stereotypes. So at the same time, you know, what we try to do is get away from trying to be everything for everyone or represent the Caribbean by portraying the human elements and focusing more on that than on um, than on a lot else. So. No, George? Okay. I mean, whoever wants to go. Oh. <laughs> um, I, I want to speak to that a little bit as well because I think when publishers do try and be everything to everyone is when we see lots of problems. And it's like when, um, you know, you think of uh, 
you know, the concept of trying to represent an entire community, it's impossible. It's impossible for you to put everybody's lived experience into one story. And that's why we need lots of stories. We need lots of representation. We, we can't just have one book published that represents uh, a person of color, an indigenous story, uh, a black or um, an intersectional story and say, okay, we can check that box off now in our publishing list and we're done for the year. And I think that's what's happened in the past and that's why there's been so many problems and that's why there's been so many small presses that have needed to come up and say, we're not okay with the representations. And it goes back to what we see in the world, um, how children are being raised, what are they seeing, what images are they seeing, what representation are they seeing, how are they seeing themselves? And if they only see negative portrayals or negative messages, then they internalize that and think, there must be something wrong with me. Yeah. But we need to ensure that, especially in classrooms, and as a teacher, I'll say this, that it's so important for these picture books that we're hearing about here from all of the panelists to be in classrooms for a very, from a very early age. It's not something that we should say, oh, well, they're just children's books. You know, we're just going to read them for fun. And that's that. Children's books are probably one of the most important socio-political tools that we can use today. Yeah. If we start introducing children's books from a really young age, we, we've seen the studies. We've seen that, you know, we see the data. Children, you know, babies as young as six years old can understand racial bias and difference. And if they can understand that, they can also understand the messages that are sent out in the world. So children's books are so important. And that's why we need a lot of voices. We can't just have one book representing an entire community because that's just not going to happen. I was brought up in Britain. I'm now living in Canada. My lived experience is very different, I'm sure, from, let's say, uh, a South Asian woman and also somebody who identifies as sick living in India or in Afghanistan. So I can't speak to their lived experiences. I can only speak to my own. And that's why we need voices from everywhere. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, from my end, I've been really intentional in, in, in the books that I've written and in the books that I'm writing right now um, to be able for, for two worlds and two realities of the Latino community to be able to exist in one story, for example, um, because, of, uh, because of systemic racism, because our community has not been able to achieve um, generational wealth for so many different reasons, there is a lot of um, poverty in our community. You know, a lot of our community is lower, you know, not middle class or lower middle class. Um, so there's a lot of economic injustices within the Latino community. So one of my challenges in writing the books is how do I let kids not be ashamed of, of poverty or of their, you know, maybe family situation, but at the same time aspire for a better future, right? So I've had to figure out how do I make those two worlds coexist. So for example, in my books where I feature profiles and mini biographies that rhyme of 11 Latinas and 11 Latinos, what I did was I was, I, I, I highlighted that, that background. So for example, Jose Hernandez, who is the first one Latino that's an engineer and he actually is an astronaut and he went to space. His parents were farmers, farm workers. So in my story, I made sure that I included that. Um, because there's a lot of children, Latino children, that their parents are farm workers. So I want them to see and to recognize like, hey, you know, I, and I write it in a very beautiful way, right? And I say, you know, something to the effect that because he was a farm worker, he was able to gain these experiences. And then he eventually became an astronaut. So the, trying to write uh, like these two different narratives um, that co can coexist. So for example, Rita Moreno, who is an Oscar winning actress, um, her mom was a seamstress. You know, that's a very humble um, profession, but I didn't want children, and my mom actually was a seamstress too. So um, I put it in the book, you know, her mom was a seamstress, um, but she wanted to be a performer. So I want to send also that message of that these two worlds can coexist. And for example, in my next book called Courageous Camila, it's about a little Latina girl um, that 
practices that wants to learn jujitsu, that wants to learn surfing, that wants to learn skateboarding, because I really wanted little Latina girls to be able to feel like, hey, I can do that, even though my mom or my family kind of doesn't really know much about women mm. in sports, right? So, um, but, but the setting is a humble setting. So like, they have to walk to the laundromat. They, the mom sells food. She's a street vendor. I don't make it the focus of the story, but I, I make it to where the little girl is proud of her mom and she sees her mom as a warrior because she's a hard worker. So I make it really intentional for these two narratives to coexist, um, meaning sending out the message of, it doesn't matter where you come from, be proud of that. There's a lot yeah. of honor in that and humility in that. Um, but that doesn't have to be your reality for the future if you don't want it to be. So that's kind of how I've dealt with, um, you know, addressing the quote stereotype, but also moving past it and moving forward. Yeah. I have so much to say to everything that each one of you has brought up. Um, also, it's so important to think about how when you are representing a child's experience in a book, it helps them map out possibilities for themselves which they haven't envisioned before, but also helps them empathize with other people, right? And it is a really tough balance, like you said, Navjot, to, to expect one particular or publishing house or people to sort of, you know, make sure that you accomplish all those tick boxes. But, um, so my question actually is that while we, we acknowledge that it is a very hard balance to achieve, you know, you cannot expect someone to do all of those things. You are also people who, who give platforms to other authors, to other illustrators. You know, you have, the, you have the ability to do that, given that you are in this profession and that you are in certain positions of power within the field, right? Um, so one of my questions is then that, how do you look at a, you know, finding authors who are able to adequately speak to certain experiences? But also within each community, there are social hierarchies, right? So how do you, how do you sort of, um, you know, find books or write books that try to map as many experiences as possible? And the example that I want to give you here is that when I was teaching, um, I would find books for my children, which was about, which I would, I would try to find books that were very close to their experiences. But I would not find books, um, I would not find books that were still very close to what they experienced, even something as simple as friendship. You know, their household structures and their lives didn't, uh, like, didn't allow for going out and meeting friends, right? So even like the smallest experiences are difficult to account for. So as people who give platforms to other writers and as, you know, people who are running publishing houses, how do you account for that? I'm going to take a swat at some of what you um, said, which is, I think, something that's being discussed a lot in the media and the whole idea of giving opportunities to um, marginalized authors. You know, I belong to a lot of different writing groups um, and I get, I see people saying, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm, why can't I write about a, a African-American experience or a Mexican-American experience or an Indian experience? You know, the, I, I write about, I'm a woman, I write about men, I write about, you know, I write about murder, I've never murdered anyone, so I don't have <laughs> to actually have lived the experience in yeah. order to write about it. But I think that the, you know, and that is, that is very true, but I think that it comes to a point where we have to recognize that there are, like, you know, if you're a, if you're a Caucasian um, and you have a certain position in society which allows you to go to a publishing house or you're an established author and so you know publishing houses that's like low-hanging fruit you know you have uh, someone who's already established so if they write another book it's easier to market it right so they're going to go for it but if you're aware of that privilege that you have and then you're aware that someone who can write your the story you're thinking about writing from an authentic position but can't get their foot in the door like you can, that maybe you need to step back and find a way to put that first person forward instead of taking their, taking their place. And so, um, you know, that's one of the things that we try to do at Caribbean Reads, which is basically to encourage um, a lot of authors to, you know, try to give them support 
um, if they're willing to accept it, and then to increase the 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 stock of of the the variety of authors' voices that we publish and that we hear, and something that we're still struggling with for sure. I'm not it's, I'm not happy with um, the breadth of authors that we represent so far, but we are working we are working on it. But I think it has to be a very um, conscious effort yeah. to seek out other voices and not to just continue to fall back on the 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 tried and true um the tried and true ones who already have their voices out there because you know as um Navjo said they there's just so many experiences to be um to be explored to be to be discussed and it's really interesting what you're saying Shani about the the um the way that children might experience friendship or you know that that is hard to capture if you haven't lived it yeah. And so, you know, I think we have to be very mindful and and purposeful about seeking out uh, um, other authors and giving them giving them a space and a voice and the support. Because part of it is that you know, like I always tell people, like Caribbean people, we're always telling stories. Right? <laughs> like this is what we do. This is how we talk. This is why I talk so much because <laughs> I can't just tell you. A to B, I have to tell you the, you know, the, the winding path to get there. But there is, uh, there is a, there are rules of writing and there are ways of expressing and there, there are things that you, you know, that you need to do and that you need to, you know, to develop a story. And so we have to kind of get that education out there and people have to be willing to understand that they need to learn these, um, these ways and to. Oh. So it's, it's complicated. Yeah. I, I had a really interesting experience because yeah. the, the book that I just mentioned earlier about the Latina um, that really wants to explore extreme sports, I actually recruited a co-author that is a Latina that actually practices all those three sports, the jujitsu, the um, skateboarding and surfing, because even though she's Mexican American, just like me, um, her experience in, in being a Latina and practicing sports has its own set of, you know, nuances, right? Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that I portrayed those experiences accurately. And I did, I did not feel comfortable writing about that because that's not my experience. And I really wanted it to be as authentic as possible. So her and I are actually co-writing and I was willing to, you know, split everything with her in order to get that authentic voice. And something interesting happened because when we sent the, the, um, the manuscript for this children's book to a, a, an editor, um, so they could just kind of you know, do the developmental edit, one of the notes that we got back was, um, you know, why does this little girl not know what a surfboard is at eight years old? That's not believable. But the, the editor was Caucasian. So, mm -hmm. So she doesn't understand that a lot of times we, we don't know what a surfboard is because we are stuck in our, in our little neighborhoods, in our communities. And sometimes going to the beach is a privilege, right? Yeah. Um, and, and we're not exposed to a lot of different things, unfortunately. So uh, as, a, as someone that has this press, this you know, publishing company, that is something that I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to say like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> it is very true that an eight-year-old may not know what a surfboard is. So there's a lot of different eyes that look at manuscripts and, you know, that, that look at your book and even if the illustration, right? If, if something is way off or too stereotypical looking or too this or too that, um, it's, it's also, um, it, I just feel like I have control over that, those aspects, right? So for yeah. example, my Latina surfer, the little girl, I mean, we, we do want to make her a little darker, like a lot darker skinned than some of my other characters, because within the Latino community, we have everything. All of our skin tones are so different. So I have control of saying, you know, how, how dark her skin should be in order for me in my publishing house to have a wide range of colors that do represent the Latino community, right? So um, in those aspects, I'm very intentional as well. And I also just signed another author who's Cuban American, who's writing about the Cuban experience. That's something I don't, even though we're both Latina, 
that's a whole different experience than what I've experienced as a Mexican American. So I am very intentional in making sure that all voices are um, authentic and that um, that I'm overseeing every step of you know from the editing process to the illustrations to you know everything. Um, so it kind of scares me to know that all of these different things are overseen in the big five publishing houses and, and who's monitoring them, who's monitoring them to make sure that, that, you know, all of these stories come out. Yeah. But you know, that, that's the work that we are doing now to, to make sure we have these authentic voices. I agree with everything that's been said so far, because I think as small presses, we're even more intentional in considering marginalized voices and the voices that have not been heard before. I think that's, that's, a core part of our work every single day and in North America right now you know we he, we see the hashtag own voices a lot which was started by Karine Duvois who really talks about thinking about the stories that are being told whose perspective are they being told from so own voices stories are really bringing to the forefront stories that are being told from lived experiences by the author and then illustrated by people who ha have lived experiences as well, because then you can really bring a certain type of authenticity to uh, a book. And children are really smart. They can tell if a story has truth or it's, it's not. My, my son calls me out all the time. So, <laughs> so it, you know, it's, it's, it, if they can see it, then you know, everyone can see it. So we really need to consider not just the books that we are publishing and writing and illustrating. We also need to think about the titles of these books because sometimes the, the problem starts right at the beginning with the title. And one of uh, the issues I have um, you know, really thought about and talked a lot about in, as in the last 10 years with my press is the representation of the Sikh identity because you know, in the past, historically, the Sikh, people don't know very much about the Sikh identity. And it's interesting because you can live in a demographic with 90% of the population who look like me, but I can walk out, my son can walk out and people don't know who he is. And he'll have the same abuse, the same bullying, the same slurs, everything still happens even though we're surrounded by people who look like us. And then you have to start wondering why that's happening. And it's happening because we have no representation in books that's actually accurate. We're, you know, we're often represented as jokesters, as party goers, as people uh, who drink a lot, who are alcoholics. So we have all of these stereotypical representations which don't, don't represent my lived experience. And you know, it's, it's really, um, demeaning i think it's dehumanizing when when that's all you see in the world that represents you and then when it comes to the dastar or the patka which is the sick turban um, people don't understand that turbans are worn by so many cultures around the world and so when it comes to the sick turban it's not the same as everybody else's turban the sick turban is a daily action of faith uh, uh, another turban could be an accessory that you wear to a wedding. So the two are not the same. So when, when some people refer to the Sikh, the star as a hat, I find that extremely problematic. And that's something that I speak a lot about because I know that that's something that small children, very young children, will get that message at a very young age. And then they start pulling my son's butt off his head, which happened. So these are our lived experiences. So this is what happens when we put titles on books that are problematic, when we put content into books, because we're saying we're, we really care about diversity. We want to publish diverse books, but we're not really thinking about what that means. So it's not enough to think about diversity anymore in 2020. We really think, need to think about equity because everything is um, connected. When you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, they have to go together. There's no such thing as equality anymore. It's not enough to be equal. There has to be equity. And equity means you need to give people what they need to succeed. And that's not always equal, but it has to be equitable. 
I think a lot has been said by everyone, but I just want to say, I think the first step in uh, being inclusive is to be intentional about it and to make that decision that my commissioning, our publishing is going to be inclusive. It's going to be so, and that's when you start being able to connect to connect the dots, you're able to st st step out of this bu publishing bubble, which is really, it's like a tiny a tiny group in many ways. Um, and you can see that so many publishing houses do it so beautifully. Tara Books works with indigenous artists. Adivani has some of the most powerful picture books that I have seen. Um, Yogesha Panthers Poise Publishing, Young Adult Dalit Writing. Um, Zuban has done call outs for uh, Northeastern writers and illustrators. Tolika has worked with trans illustrators and writers as well. So we at Pratham Books have tried to develop different models. One is direct commissioning, where we work with different communities to find new writers and illustrators. Social media has been great in that sense because it's given a platform to many, many more creators and easy access to them. And lastly, we've worked on creating a workshop model, which enables to go, out, go to a particular community, work with them over a few days to deconstruct the whole art of a picture book, because a picture book looks very easy. And I'm sure everyone here knows how difficult condensing your thoughts into 200 words or sometimes a wordless book is. And um, we often find that um, uh, the responsive, the stories that come from these workshops are special because they're really real. Um, we spent hours with a tiger researcher who works in Ranthambore Tiger Reserve in Rajasthan, uh, listening to his stories about the tiger. And he, he's from Sabai Madhupur and he works with NCBS. Um, and the story that came out from there, which Mujahid wrote is, wrote, is called Tiger, Tiger, Where Are You? And it's a STEM book about tiger research, but it's just Mujahid's story about living in the forest with the tiger and uh, walking in the forest with where the tiger walks. And I think that, you know, it just comes down to saying, we're going to do this and we're going to make it happen. And it will. Mm. Again, such like really, really great responses. And thank you for sharing so much. Um, so I have very little time before I could take uh, audience questions, but I have one thing that I want to end with. Um, so, you know, like we've said, like there's a way in which currently the world is acknowledging children's book, you know, suddenly when, when the uh, Black Lives Matter movement happened, everyone is suddenly talking about children's book and how we need to find answers and solutions in children's books. Um, but so, so in this particular point in time where we are going through multiple crises in one, in, at one time, you know, um, how are the ways in which, how are these social justice movements challenging the consciousness of children's uh, publishing today? And, and also, how can we make these books available to kids who are actually marginalized? Right? We're talking about writing for them, but children's books are often very expensive, you know? Um, because of the labor that goes into them, but how do we, how do these books reach the right audience? And uh, yeah, very quickly, before we move on to audience questions, because I see there are lots. Can I take the second part of your question, Sharanya? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think access is perhaps one of the most important things when it comes to inclusion and diversity, because uh, a lot of times books otherwise uh, as you said, price point distribution uh, channels, they only stay with a certain class of children. And uh, for instance, at Pratham Books, our price points for each book is under a dollar and everything is open source. It means that you can log a reviewer and have access to around 20,000 stories in more than 200 languages. So democratizing the content for us has really helped to travel and We've seen great stories coming from the lockdown where children who don't have access to books at home uh, have access through a gadget because librarians are working to curate content to them. I think given the social political scenario right now, I'm quite excited to say that we constantly see a lot of, uh, like the children's book industry in India has been seeing a renaissance almost, like we are seeing stories, uh, Siddharth Sharma, who's part of uh, Belong Fest, um, he's speaking tomorrow, I think, he's written about um, uh, 
uh, the Gon tribals taking on a corporate uh, who want to mine their sacred mountains. There are stories which are written by differently able writers. Um, there's a lot more political uh, stories that are coming into our narrative and they were always there, but I think that a lot more intentional commissioning is happening now. And I'm, I, for one, am really excited about it. I can speak to the, the, the what I'm seeing in Canada and um, across, like in the US, from what I'm hearing in the kid lit space. But um, I think with the Black Lives Matter movement, obviously um, people so uh, conscious suddenly woke up for some people. It seemed to be, you know, like suddenly we, we didn't know about this before as if it's never happened before. Um, this has been happening for a long time. People just haven't been open to recognizing it and actually um, you know, understanding systemic racism and what's actually been happening for a, a long, long time historically. And so I think systemically institutions have to change um, if we really want to see change in the publishing industry. But we also have to remember that, yes, you know, all of these books suddenly got sold out in every single bookshop. And why did that happen? And we have to think about that because we have to think about allyship. And when allyship becomes performative like that, where people think, I'm just going to buy a whole load of books, I'm going to stock my shelf, and now I'm going to be able to look at my shelf and see all these diverse authors, and I'll know that I'm not a racist. Mm -hmm. It's not about that. It's not about performative action. It's what you're going to actually do with those books. Are you actually going to pick up those books and read them with your children? and re talk about it within your families and extended families so that they really understand what this is. Do they understand what systemic racism is, what power struggles are? Because historically in publishing, it's been the gatekeepers who've kept our voices out, who've kept our stories out. So we need to think historically whose voices have been heard and by whom? Who's had that power all this time? Why have they been able to have this power all this time? And why do we need to do this much work, all of us here on this panel? Why are we working so hard to get our voices heard? Because we are faced with barriers too. Um, you know, distribution, stop accessibility. When, when you don't have distribution and wide distribution channels, it's not always possible for our books to be accessible for children. And then when it comes to price points, I know from my own personal experience, I don't get any funding. I get no outside, no provincial, no federal funding for this work. So when I go out to do this work, I'm doing it intentionally. And it's because I know there's a need and I have to make sure that it's the best it can be. So when I bring in you know, different illustrators and authors, I'm very intentional about who I'm bringing in and what they can actually represent. So unless we have that intentional um, cultural shift and we know power starts at the top. So we need to start changing those, shifting those mindsets. And yes, publishers are putting all these statements out and saying, you know, we care, we're going to create changes, but let's see what those changes will be. Let's see how those changes take place, when those changes take place. We know we're doing the work, but we also need some help. We need distribution channels. We need to have people understand that they will have to pay for these books in order for them to become accessible. In our culture, as a South Asian woman, I can say there's a cultural um, norm in our culture to think everything should be free, like books should be handed out free. And I have to constantly like, you know, go against that and, and talk about it and say why that's not a good thing. And the silence in our community sometimes is an issue as well because people in our community don't always speak up when they see problems. They're okay with the status quo because they really want to, you know, continue that model minority myth sometimes. So there's lots of other layers that we need to shift during this process. So when we talk about systemic issues, it's not something that can change overnight. This is a long-term goal that we all have. And I can see everybody on this panel is doing it. We're all working towards that goal. So, and we know how hard it is. So we need intentional allies to back us up and support us along the way as well. Thank you, Nojo.
Yeah, I think um, I agree with you entirely. And, um, you know, we have tried, we would love to have, not, I agree with you about not giving the books away. We got a value. We have to put value on the, the things that are important, right? But I would love to sell our books at a lot lower price point, but we just can't. It's just, <laughs> we just cannot do it. And um, I think that one of the things that we've seen with a lot of the movements that have been happening um, throughout the world recently is that there is power that can come from below. And I think that if we can, if that power could be, could be channeled a little bit towards the publishing uh, market and towards demanding books, that represent a wider um, breadth of, and that authentically rep represent a wider, wider breadth of the, the world that we've been seeing so far, that we, we could see. Because, you know, one of the things that drives prices of books is the, is the volume. You know, if we could print um, 50,000 copies of a book, then we could sell it for a whole lot less because the printing cost would be a lot less. And so, you know, that yeah. we need that demand. We need the teachers to demand the books. We need the, the parents to demand the books for their children. And then the children, I mean, the children demand them, but they can. I've been to book festivals and seen parents talk their children out of buying a book. Um, mm. So I know it's not, <laughs> not about the children. You know, I mean, they can influence, but the parents have to believe that this is yeah. important and that they need to expose their kids. And the teachers have to believe that um, they're going to invest the time into, you know, learning a new book, learning how to getting, uh, learning how to teach a new book and that sort of thing. And that's one of the, the ways that we will see a change in the children's book market as well. I've been able to be lucky enough to partner with some organizations that actually do have the funds and buy, you know, a thousand copies wholesale price and then, and then distribute them to low income communities um, like reading rock stars, which is part of the Texas book festival. Um, I'm just doing, I'm actually doing a campaign right now with Hispanic stars LA where they're trying to raise money so they can buy books from us and then distribute it to, to low income communities. And part of the campaign is me reading my book on my um, Instagram and kind of just making a call to action to everyone. If you go to my Instagram, you'll see it um, where I'm inviting people to donate to that organization. But yeah, I mean, that's extra work that's on us, right, to do. Um, but I feel like it's kind of, for me, it's kind of part of the package. Like I see my press as, um, I do see it as more, it, it's my mission. And I just, and I feel like I need to also do that other work, like find partnerships that can have, you know, the funds or do have the funds or are backed by people with money that want to do good, but it's finding those partners too. Right. Um, and that's work. Um, but I also try to read my book on social media with some kind of a partner, at least, at least once a month to a, so other kids that may not be able to afford it. So they can at least hear the words they can at least hopefully have that memory of, oh, I remember, you know, reading about Latino scientists and astronauts and inventors. So that's what I'm doing. And I have donated, you know, 20 books here, 10 books here to different organizations. But yeah, I think we, we have that extra burden on us where we are um, small. We don't have a lot of the funds. We don't have a lot of the, um, you know, the infrastructure to help us be able to donate more, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm doing what those little things that I mentioned, but those partnerships have really been um, valuable. Yeah. Thank you for that. Now, um, before uh, time ends, I need to quickly jump, in, jump into the audience questions. Um, so Sandhya asks, um, sorry, Karuna asks, uh, how can we ensure that children's books addresses difficult issues like gender fluidity? And what age is appropriate for such challenging concepts? Because often parents are scared that these books might put ideas into their heads. So I guess in general, apart from even gender fluidity, when, when is the right age and how does one approach difficult topics? Anyone who I feels, think, yeah, yeah I, think it, I think it's at any age. I think when you introduce children's books to children, 
that's the time you can uh, introduce a picture book that has a gender fluid character or uh, has a LGBTQ plus theme. I don't think there's a, I don't think um, children are as biased as we, as we are as adults. And when you talk to them about these um, differences from a very young age, it becomes normal for them. We've spoken to our, our son about gender fluidity, you know, LGBTQ plus community, disability, uh, different, you know, learning abilities. All of these things have been part of our talk at home. And we've done it from a very, very young age. And even though you start really simply like with very, very simple ideas, you wouldn't just jump into the whole thing. You would talk about, you know, differences at first from a very young age. And when children understand differences, then you could go to the next stage. Yeah. So you, pick, you can pick books. There are lots of books out there right now that, um, you know, are really trying to amplify those voices. And I think it's important for us to do it at a very young age. The more we talk to our children from a young age, the less bias they'll have as they grow older. Yeah. Anyone else? Deja, do you want to? I think uh, Navjot said everything that I'd like to. Okay. That was a great answer. Okay. So shall I move on to the next question? So, I mean, a lot of people are asking about two things. So. One is that, like we discussed this in the morning diversity panel as well, with children's books particularly, parents make the decision, right? Parents pick out the books. And so how do you, and parents like to pick books with moral stories, you know, with some learning at the end of it. And, and that's what you sort of want to give a child, right? Um, there's been the notion, like what's the moral of the story? So how do you, how do you navigate that? And how do you convince people because the adults need to be choosing the books. So how do you convince them to pick up daring topics and more controversial issues? You know, as I mentioned before, I've seen parents talk their, their um, children out of buying books that they're interested in. So it is definitely a big um, problem. And we actually particularly stay away from books that have a strong moral lesson. Like the lesson comes in the book like you know you get it as you read and you see the experiences of the of the characters you get it and you you know if you see like for example with the question before if you see characters of you know varying backgrounds varying sexual identities gender identities in the stories and just you know you kind of understand that people are people and there's no need to to discriminate or be afraid of someone or to be, you know, have prejudice about someone. And mm -hmm. so we try to really have the moral kind of incorporated, if there is, a, you know, the lesson incorporated in the story and not at the end, oh, so you see, Johnny did X and then, you know. <laughs> but, but, you know, parents do want their children to, they do want their children to see certain lessons um, come across. So I think what we have to do maybe is to have different marketing strategies that um, that are targeted at different segments of the audience, of the you know the, the the people who are buying versus the kids who are, um, and that comes through the 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 face of the book, the words, the um, the, the the the. The, I'm sorry, I'm losing my words. The captions, the the descriptions, and all of that sort of thing. I think is where that what plays into reaching the different segments of your of our market. You know, one of the things that I constantly feel this question should actually be asked to publisher, to parents, and to teachers, and let them mm -hmm. answer this because we've got the books out there. We've written them. We've published them. Now, I think it's our your responsibility as participants and panelists turn the question to them and ask them, but why are you not reading them or buying them and let them answer it? <laughs> it's interesting, Bijal, because um, I was at a, a diversity roundtable where that question came up. And it was interesting because a lot of the editors and publishers were saying, well, you know, what is it? Why are teachers not buying these books? And I said, well, first of all, teachers have such a limited time to um, get so much done in a classroom. Curriculum is constantly changing. So yeah. they, they feel overwhelmed as it is with curriculum and the amount of content that they need to teach in a classroom. Teachers need to be able to pick up a book that sometimes has a teacher's guide because that just helps them pick up that book and say, okay, I know what I'm gonna do with this book because there's discussion questions, there's something I can do with it. 
So when I wrote Alliance Maine 10 years ago, I ensured that I also created a teacher's guide with it because I knew that as soon as they saw the cover of my book, there'd be a whole load of fear, which there was, because these teachers were saying, well, you know, I really don't know what that is. I, I just don't even know how I'm going to bring that into the classroom. So I said, well, here's your teacher's guide. So now you can take it into your classroom. You can use that in your classroom. And it's not only for a heritage month once a year. You can keep it in your classroom all year long. Yeah. So those are the kinds of strategies I think we need to consider. And you, you're right. You have to talk to teachers. You have to talk to parents and say, what do you need in order for this book to work for you? And when you talk to teachers, that those are the kinds of things they need. They need something that's ready to go because they have limited amounts of time and yes it might be an excuse some people may see that as an excuse but I've been in a classroom as well and I know that it's the timing is everything it's about you know how much time do you have what can you bring in I would always always source diverse texts and texts that would disrupt thinking in my classroom but it will, first of all they're not always accessible and then you have the gatekeepers again who's going to buy those books for your mm -hmm. classroom unless you go out and buy them yourself. So yeah. a lot of the work that I've been doing recently has been with school districts and the gatekeepers and saying, yeah. well, are you actually intentional when you put out your equity policies or is that performative action? Yeah. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of work as well. Um, we have a curriculum um, expert on our team and we've been doing, you know, putting out teacher's guides as, alongside the books as well. Because yeah, it's a lot of work. You know, and if you've had a book that you've taught and you know this book has done, you can go in a classroom, close your eyes and teach it. It's hard to think about incorporating a new book. So we've definitely yeah. been doing that as well. Yeah. Um, so Niyati asks, and, and I know that you're all writers as well, right? And so how do, you, how do you separate those two identities when you're writing? Because you know so much about the industry at this point, but... When you are writing these diverse stories, how do you how do you make the story about diversity, but you don't center it around an issue that you're trying to address, so that it doesn't come across as a lesson in diversity? <laughs> I think we could all talk to this, but <laughs> um, I don't think we center diversity ever when we're writing these stories. We 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 center a lived experience. We center what we feel really strongly about. And I think all writers and authors do that. When you write a story that's really, really going to connect with your readers, it's, it's going to have to come from a place of truth. And if it's not coming from a place of truth, it's going to be very easy to see that. It's going to be very easy to see that you just wrote this book just because you want it to be a diverse book. And so when you're writing your story, just, just write your own lived experience, write something that you can relate to, you can connect to, and that story will come out the way it's meant to come out. It, don't force it. Don't force it to be diverse if it's not going to have that angle. If you come from a place of diversity, I think that comes out in your story. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I completely agree with Navjot. Um, yeah, like when I write my books, it, 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 I, I'm not... I'm not thinking how can I be diverse? It's just literally writing what, I, what I've lived or what I know, what I, and then because of that, it's already diverse. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people also want to know, like you have spoken about the struggles of breaking into this industry and finding a place for yourself. So a lot of people want to know that, A, how do, how do more people do that? How do people who, because a lot of people have experiences but don't think they're writers or illustrators. And so people want to know how should they hone their skills or, or if they are already writers, how should they break into an industry which is hard you know, to make a place in? Uh, well, I think one of the th best ways to hone your writing, and I constantly say this is please read more. If you're doing children's books, please read more children's books. We constantly get pitches from people who've never read a children's book in their life, but they want to write children's books. You've got to be respectful to the uh, space that you're writing in. So read, research. If you're pitching to a publishing house, 
first look at what are the kind of books they publish. Don't send a middle grade novel to a picture book house and don't send a young adult uh, and don't send a picture book to uh, a, a young adult uh, publishing house or a graphic novel space. So first do your research and then send it out. Um, the other thing is that there are lots of now um, uh, uh, internationally, especially there is lots of pitch fest that happen on social media where you can um, follow and try and pitch your novels. There are also uh, pitching spaces that happen at festivals. So come, there are lots of uh, editors who are out there who are always looking for interesting voices. Uh, make sure your presentation of your manus your chapter, sample chapter and everything is typo free because uh, make sure it is well presented. And uh, uh, you know, if uh, and I think everyone's stories here do resonate one thing. If one publishing house did not love your manuscript does not mean necessarily you are a bad writer. It just means that it was not a right fit for them. Keep trying and you will, if it's meant to be, if it's a good book, it will find a reader, find a home. Yeah. And something very simple is also after you've written your manuscript, send, send it to beta readers um, and get their comments. And, and beta readers could, could be literally friends, family, because sometimes you think it's this most amazing script, right? Um, we all think our, our, our stories are amazing, but then, you know, you'll get the same feedback from all of those 10 people that you sent it to. Like, why is, you know, why is this character doing this? It's happened to me where I've sent it to 10 of my friends and family and they all give me the same feedback. So I think that's a really good practice to, to have beta readers read your, your script. Yeah. Carol, I know that you uh, mentor a lot of uh, young writers, you know, for, for your publishing house. So do you have anything to say? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing that I said, I love what you said, Vijal, about reading, right? Because a lot of people don't, don't uh, realize how important it is. You know, they feel like they have this unique story. So why should I read? Because mine is going to be so much different from everyone else. But as I said before, there are norms and there are, you know, like, I feel like you have to understand the norms and then you can break them. But you have to understand what you're breaking first. Like you don't have to write what everybody else is writing, but you need to understand the basics. And you know, the second thing is to write. Like I tell people, you have to practice. It's a muscle. You have to practice writing. You have to keep writing, and you can do that by writing your work. You can be, you know, do writing, um, putting little little snippets out on Facebook on social media to you know get feedback you can share i think sharing your writing little bits helps to get your also to get your name out there to get you some visibility so when you do um pitch or you do send out to different places you know you can show that you you built this community and that you've been doing you've been putting in the work um because writing is hard work it's not um it's not it's not easy and i also encourage so you know the, the first thing you read you write um you gotta be very intentional about that process and then it's very very important to to listen to to give to give your writing some air let people read it um step away from it for a while come back let other people read it and then listen to what they say yeah. Because, you know, it's hard, like you're writing, you're putting your heart on the page and then somebody comes and tells you, oh, your heart is right. <laughs> you know, like it's, that's, that's hard to hear and hard to accept. And you don't have to take the advice that you get. You really don't, but you should listen to it and, you know, live with it for a little bit. And um, before you think, okay, yeah, that's an interesting point, but that's not what I was trying to to do so that's not mm -hmm. relevant that's fine but you know um there's a book that i've been working on for a few couple of years now and i'm getting a lot of shoves now to try and get it out um and looking i put it down for a year and coming back to it now this month has been so instructive because i've seen i'm seeing a lot of the this why is that i didn't put it out like i knew it wasn't ready mm -hmm. and that just allowed me to kind of look at it almost like a beta reader and um, see some of the the issues on my own so so yeah read 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 write 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 and listen yeah. and then read some more <laughs> thank you yes 
No, Joel, do you have anything to say to this? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody's correct. You have to start with reading books. And I think um, I, I'm a very, very small press. So it, it's um, something that I, I needed to launch Saffron Press in order to get my voice heard. So I think authors need to understand that if you're really passionate about what you're doing and it's a story that really needs to be heard, it's coming from, let's say, it's coming from a really marginalized community or, or a voice that's pretty much invisible in publishing, then don't give up. If you can't get it published by a traditional house, then self-publish because there's just so many platforms available today in 2020 that you can't wait any longer. If it's something that you feel is of quality and you've done the work, you've done the reading, you've done the editing, you've really polished that work, then you know that's another, another um, journey that you could take. And I don't think it should... Um, continue to have the taboo associated with self-publishing anymore because a lot of quality books are coming out of self-publishing and then traditional publishers are taking them because they know, they know that they're building a huge platform from self-publishing. So I think that should be given value too. And there's lots of places where you can find those platforms as well. So I think there's so many different ways to get published these days that we don't need to be in a box anymore. Yes. Well, we have reached the end of today's session. But before we close out, um, do you have any closing statements um, about diversity in children's publishing and what we should look forward to? I would just say, write, write, write. And if you believe in the work that you're doing, don't give up. Um, I'd really like to thank you for inviting me to be part of this amazing panel. I, I think I've learned a lot. And so I think it's inspiring to sit with um, people who are, have worked this hard to get marginalized voices into the world. And I think these voices should be valued. And I think the more we amplify each other's voice, the easier our work will become. I just want to add that I think the children's writing community is a fantastic one. It's dynamic, it's vibrant, and uh, listening to all of you has been fabulous. And um, one of the things, as uh, uh, Navjot said, keep writing. And the most important thing is to remember that writing is an empowering it's firstly writing is learned so it is an act of privilege when you get to be able to write and you get to be published so um it is very empowering and it also comes with that uh slight responsibility so uh as writers and as editors we sh for me i think that's perhaps very very important i'd just like to add one more thing i hope you go <laughs> i'm sure. just looking if we look at the screen right now, I think if we're if this is a diversity, inclusion, and equity panel, we should also see who's missing. So I don't see any men right now. So like we need to think about where are the men in uh, children's publishing as well? Are they publishing um, these marginalized voices? And are they amplifying? Are they allies? Like who are they? So we need to think about that as well. We need to think about the intersectional identities. Where are they? So when we think about this, we also need to always, in the back of our mind, always consider who's missing. Yeah. Thank you. That's a very important point. Naive, uh, Carol? Yeah. I just wanted to thank you so much for moderating. Thank you thank for this you. amazing platform. Um, and I also want to know, want to say that it is important for us. And, and I know I do this on my social media. Is I do promote books that are not from my own press. Um, I promote other writers, I promote other titles that I think have something valuable to say, even though, because I don't consider books as competition at all. Um, I see, just like someone mentioned that we need a lot of books. It's not, one book is not going to solve the, <laughs> the system of racism, or it's not going to be the all, you know, the, that thing that solves all of our problems. We need many, many, many books. So for me, I, you know, as a small press, I can only produce so many books a year, maybe two, maybe three. So I take it on as, as an additional um, task to keep promoting other books that I think have something valuable to say. Um, so hopefully I will be promoting all of your books on my um, platforms and hopefully we will stay in touch and keep supporting each other. Thank you. So we can't do everything. So we definitely work. We do a lot of partnership, and we're very supportive of um, 
other organizations and try to work together. And I guess the thing that I wanted to say, um, apart from thank you so much, Shani, it's been really nice to meet you and to, <laughs> to um, you know, the conversations we've had and the emails we've exchanged. It's been, I've been really um, happy to be a part of this whole endeavor. And as I said, next year in person. <laughs> but um, I also want to say, you know, if you're out there listening and you're kind of thinking, oh, children's book, diversity, I don't really see where I fit into that. Um, think a little bit harder because, you know, if you're a writer, then, you know, you need to be writing illustrators. If you're um, a parent, a teacher, then, you know, you need to be talking about these things in your schools with your children, you know, encouraging people to, to support and to buy a wide swath of books, you know, some of what you're already buying, but, you know, look beyond that. If you're a grandparent, you know, I usually tell people, do you have a child in your life? Like, you know, <laughs> everybody has a child in their life. And then, you know, there are, there's so many ways that you can support, getting the word out, um, donating to, you know, some of the organizations that Naibay mentioned that support um, book publishing, book publishing, you know, um, diverse publishing. And there's just, there's some way that you can you can help to expand our reach to help us to reduce the price of the books to help us to get the books to the communities that need them the you know all the things that you're talking about so whatever you're sitting out there and you're thinking oh this doesn't really apply to me it does it applies to all of us because we're building the future you know like the kids mm -hmm. like they're the ones who are going to be looking after us when we're old <laughs> we we want we we're, we're building there we're creating something for them so yeah. it's important well thank you thank you so much this was my first time moderating and i couldn't think of a better panel and better panelists to have a discussion with you've all been so warm and so supportive and thank you for sharing so much of your experience with us and hopefully we'll be in touch Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Nice meeting you guys. Nice to meet you too. Nice to meet all of you.